All right, guys, so today I sat down with my good friend TFN from Product. Product is one of the industry leaders in product procurement for small and medium sized businesses. They work with a lot of influencers. Um, they work with Pat Flynn during the COVID 19 crisis. They did a lot of really cool work supplying PPE for local hospitals around Utah. They're just an awesome business, and I think it's an awesome conversation for anyone who wants to learn about product procurement and how global supply chains work. So check it out. What's what's new in the world of product? Oh, big things. Um, a lot of new customers for us. We've been working on a lot of projects, helping hospitals, care facilities, get the PPE they need out of China, Vietnam, wherever it may be. And uh, that's been fun and fulfilling you know it's different when you know you're actually helping save lives like it literally makes a difference to those that receive the product so that's been um a good change of pace for us <laughs> and then uh really we're seeing an influx of influencers and creators realize that they need to diversify their revenue stream and that they're leaving money on the table by not creating custom products you know, merch and things like that, that's been around forever. It's not going anywhere, but they're realizing their marketing capabilities and that they can actually create the products they would want that their audience also wants. So really, really big things in 2020. Yeah, no, I think, I think especially the like, cause I think a lot of people think right with like influencers, like, Oh, let's just make new merch. Yeah. And like, yeah, it works. You can make money, but like, if you're not like Logan Paul, Jake Paul, someone huge, you're not going to make $10 million a year selling merch, you know? Well, and what we've also noticed is even them, they're pushing their merch. They're treating it like, a, like an apparel yeah. company where they're wearing it, like their own branded clothing, like a brand deal. And then they have Facebook ads and Instagram ads. It's not as simple as saying, here's my store, go buy the stuff. And hopefully people show up you actually have to try to sell it, right? Just like you would any other product, so. Yeah, but then I think you see like an influx of, at the same time, more targeted offers, kind of like what you guys did with Pat Flynn in the Switch pod, where yeah. by creating something unique, it immediately can get larger than that person's normal reach. You That's know? exactly right. That's exactly right. We 100% you know, we make the merch, we make the sweaters, the hoodies, the hats, like we do all that stuff. But where we see true value creation is in creating a unique product. And a few years ago, white labeling was still considered unique and different, right? That's not really the case anymore. And so we found that as people really create something that is their own, that's unique, like the switch pod, that they're able to create a lot more value and they expand their reach. And what was interesting with, um, with switch pod is a lot of the influencers that started selling it and becoming affiliates weren't in the first or second network of Pat and Caleb. They were people they, they didn't know, right. That ended up finding it from a friend of a friend and then up pitching it and selling it and have since created for them millions of dollars in sales. Yeah. And I think, I think it's just kind of, it's that idea, right? Is we all think of like the simple thing. Cause it's, I mean, not to marginalize anything, but like, it's pretty easy to say, you know what? I want to come up with a new sweater idea. So I'm going to go pay a graphic designer to come up with 10 designs, send them over. You guys put them on a sweater, but something like the switch pod. I mean, that took, I remember, seeing the number on time. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but you guys spent a huge amount of money engineering that product, right? That's right. We, we spent a lot of time, time and money is yeah. the, the key phrase there because there are certain things that weren't billable, you know, that just was part of the work. And so, um, yeah, the switch pod, I actually have one on my desk right here. Oh yeah. You should show it off. And what, what is the switch pod for anyone that's not watch or has the switch pod is a revolutionized tripod and vlogging device. So it does what the selfie stick was meant to do, but didn't actually accomplish very well before a real camera. And it allows you to go to 
a tabletop mode where you can set it down and continue filming very, very quickly, relatively quietly. Um, what happens is when you're generally filming yourself as a vlogger and you're filming yourself, you sometimes have to put it down while you're cooking or talking to someone or showing a phone or whatever it may be. And that would before mean setting it up, taking the camera down, setting it back up, starting over, and they're cutting a lot more film. Whereas now they can make much longer um, series of videos. So, uh, but the switch pod took, you know, I can't even remember how long it took, but it, it took at least 10 to 12 months to really get the idea dialed in into production. Um, and it was an iterative process. It, it was difficult, but I would think if you ask Pat and Caleb today, was it worth the time and money? They would say absolutely 100% yes. And now we're in the process. They released their ball head a few months ago. They're releasing a new item in about three, four weeks. And then they're releasing four or five new items before Christmas comes. So we're really seeing that, you know, because the idea was unique, and um, disrupted the marketplace that they're now able to release a whole catalog of items and really grow their offering vertically and laterally growing revenue presence influence and everything that comes with it yeah um and how would you because i know you guys have kind of some interesting takes and ideas on this what would you recommend to someone who's like i know i want to come up with a new product for my audience or even for <clears throat> say me like at sorry <clears throat> at Patrick Goodair Designs right we already have a lot of customers but I want to come up with a new product for my customers for my audience how do you recommend trying to come up with something that's a little new and serves my demographics needs you know people talk about being out of the box and, and it sounds so abstract and out of the box to be out of the box if I can be so cliche but um but it's really not just like I, I think of like of extremes, like be a little extreme, be a little ridiculous, try to fail, like try something that doesn't work, but that's fixing a specific need. And as you do that, and the more, the more you start asking yourself questions, why, 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 you start to think of root causes of problems. So why are influencers cutting their film so often? Why are they putting their hand next to their camera? That becomes ob obnoxious. And as you start to ask yourself these whys, you realize, oh, wait a second. They don't have something that they actually need to carry and film. And that's what happened with the switch pod, right? Pat and Caleb, they knew that there was a problem, but they didn't know how to resolve it. So you take, you identify the problem, then you bring these, these creatives people that can really find solutions to it and uh, you really end up with really cool ideas which is one of the things Patrick Adair does really cool I mean he finds just weird materials right things that the average person doesn't think about and then he's like I'm gonna make a ring out of it I don't know how it's gonna turn out I guarantee you 99% of the time he doesn't know how the <laughs> ring is going to turn out he just kind of does it and he's like you know what that was cool well, let's sell it right and that's, that's really what it is. Just not being afraid to fail and saying, you know what, let's see what happens. No, oh, yeah. And I think, I think that's perfect. Cause it's like you said, it comes down to not being afraid to fail. We have to try new things. And also thinking of for a lot of products, kind of like what's the why behind it. And so a lot of the time it's identifying customer problems or issues, even in your own life of like, Hey, how do I fix this issue? I mean, for Patrick, obviously it's, how do I make something out of this material? Because right. that's his process, right? Is he goes out and he goes, sits on eBay for hours and goes, oh, I found this really cool new material. I'm going to buy it. We're going to make something out of it. We'll figure it out when it shows up. Exactly. Um, I wanted to touch on though. So product for people who don't realize by now or from the intro is a company that I guess you could say this better than I could. Give me like the 30 second elevator pitch on what does proud up do we are a sourcing company we help go from idea to fulfillment with a customer handling everything and as little and as much as creating and generating the idea engineering sourcing manufacturing shipping fulfillment warehousing anything to and in between 
that's what we do and we do it quite well. Yeah. And okay, this is where I wanted to go. How did, how did you guys start Proud Up? It's kind of like, where did that idea come from? Because I've never actually heard that story myself. So there, there's three versions of the story because there's three partners, but I'll tell <laughs> you mine. There we go. Um, I was working for a company out of Hawaii in Utah as a general, as their general manager. Look at that, me mumbling. <laughs> and um, we found that we were extremely good at the supply chain part of the business. We, we actually had some excess capacity on the operation side. And so I wanted to do some consulting and see if we could create some revenue that way. We did some consulting and it worked. We didn't make a lot of money, but we, we showed that there was a need among small and medium sized companies in the Utah area specifically to learn how to source better, whether it be domestically in China, in Mexico, wherever, right? There wasn't a good understanding of what it took to buy a product well at a good price and then have pieces fall into play on the logistics side. But we, we also at the same time said, you know, the skate company needs to stay doing what we do, and that's making skate supplies. So at that time, Richie and Jace, my other business partners, they had been speaking about creating a company to help source products because Richie's customers were looking for help creating physical products, going from digital to physical, kind of like Pat and Caleb did. Um, and at that time, you know, Jay said, we need to bring tea into this. So we did, we created the company. A month later, we had our first customer. They ordered like $650. We were stoked. We're like, yes, huge win. We got a customer, best thing ever. And, uh, and we were doing some work and, you know, didn't really make any money for the first five to six months. And then um, through a podcast, we actually got a new customer. And uh, from that podcast and through future podcasts through this customer, we can trace back millions of dollars in sales from that one episode. And so uh, we love being on podcasts. If you're starting a business, we think it's a great way to, to display your services, your value add, but that's how product started. It was just, let's do it, a $600 client and guesting on podcasts, literally. Dude. That's so sweet. And especially to like see where you guys are now. Cause I mean, how many products, like not SKUs, but actual items would you say you guys move, you know, in a year? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't even know how to answer that. You know, we moved a million units last week of something. See, that's what I mean. It's so, like, so from $600 to eight figure somewhere in the eight figure maybe even nine figure range of units moved you know yearly yeah you know and it's it's interesting because we also sell tiny homes for example and um and people sometimes ask us what's your minimum what's your things it's just it's always hard to figure out because you know on a on a bottle cap you might be making half a penny a piece but sell 10 or 20 million pieces right Whereas on a tiny house, you might sell one, but make 10 or $15,000 a piece. So a unit. So that, that's part of the excitement of our job. And I think I like that. I don't think personally, I would have succeeded very well in a mundane role, doing things over and over and over again. And what I like about what I do specifically is it's always exciting. It's always different. You know, it, it's always fresh. It's always a new product, a new customer, a new idea, a new vendor. And it really keeps things interesting. But at the same time, I realize how complex that is for the average business to start out and figure out all of these moving parts, right? So we fit in a good place where we like what we do and we solve a lot of headaches for the average business. Yeah. And because you guys do, like you said, right, you guys do almost, you can do small sections if it makes sense for that client but a lot of the time you guys can do full supply chain right where you're shipping for them or overseeing fulfillment of products right 
for uh, many of our customers, we do that. We don't own the warehouses, so you know, yeah. don't get me don't get me wrong there. But we have a lot of customers that say, no, no, just get it to my door, take care of everything for me, and they, and they give us a lot of trust, and we really respect that and and cherish that. But our goal is to do it with as little headache as possible and to do it for less than a customer would be able to do it on their own. Yeah. And I think we do that well. No. Yeah. And I think that's, I think it's a great service and especially like we see it all the time, especially like in the local Utah scene. I know mm. you live in, you do live in Utah, right? You're not in, I live in Utah, Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was like, I was pretty sure you were, but I was like, is he in Hawaii with Richie? Or somewhere else, I guess. No, Jason this call would looks. be too early for me. It'd be 6.15 in Hawaii. I mean, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, not getting up at 6.15. No, not doing it for, maybe for Lewis, but I don't know that's, the average podcast. That's why you start your own company. So you don't have to wake up at 6.15, right? Exactly. But, See, but I think you and I both know you end up being up a whole lot more working for yourself <laughs> than you would for someone else. It's like, I'm going to give up the, the nine to five for the five to nine. <laughs> yeah. See, I don't know. But see, for me, I do it a lot of the time. I do like the, like the 10 to 3 a.m. instead. Exactly. Know? Yep. It lets me at least control, like never get up before the sun. That's my rule, you know? Ooh, bold. <laughs> um, so I want to touch. So you were working with a skate supply company. I assume that was, was that the one owned by Jace Bennett? Yep. It was called Jace Boards. Okay. And how did you get there? Because I mean, a general manager role is a pretty good role and you're a pretty young guy, right? You were just, was it last year or the year before you were on Forbes 30 under 30? Uh, I, I didn't get it. I was oh, nominated. Sorry. I, I didn't win. Nah, that's all right. It's all right. You know, you can't win them all. But um, I was nominated for Forbes. So that was, um, that was two years ago, I think. Yeah, that was two years ago. Um. I became general manager through Jace's business partner who reached out to me and said, look, uh, come work with us. I'll mentor you through it. And he and Jace mentored me a lot and taught me a tremendous amount. And um, honestly, I was probably not ready for the role, but um, I think I became highly capable at it very quickly. And I think they saw the potential in me and really let me grow and flourish and, and help make it a successful operation. One of the things we did, for example, was we brought back manufacturing from China to the US. So we ended up having a warehouse and a fulfillment center and a skate park. And so, you know, our operations became pretty big. We also started selling in Costa Rica, Mexico, Brazil, Korea, Taiwan, China. So all of a sudden, you know, the little skate park running out of our skate company running out of Jace's garage while I was there became this large flourishing business. And uh, yeah, it, it was, they gave me a lot of trust, probably more than I would have given myself. Yeah. But I think, I don't know. I think like I can see it in my own life and obviously like Patrick's the same age as me. So like it, it's, and he wasn't like wildly successful before. So it was kind of simultaneous, but right. I was also like, you know, that's, I feel like where the most growth happens. It's like that quote, you know, growth happens outside your comfort zone or whatever, but it's exactly, you get thrust into a position where you're like, Oh, I don't actually know how to do this. But if you, you know, I feel like, especially when you're like an entrepreneurial minded person. Oh, sorry. One of the Alexas is having issues. Um, but when you're an entrepreneurial minded person, you rise to that occasion. Cause you're like, you know what, I'm going to conquer this challenge. Yeah. And then that's where you get the most growth, right? It's cause you're like, it forces you to learn. Faster. Well, that's totally right. Because you're like, Oh, opportunity. Like where everyone gives up and says, I can't do it. You, the entrepreneur see the opportunity and say, Oh no, no, I'm going to be the one. And then you work through it and find the solutions. I think an entrepreneur thrives in a high pressure, high stress, um, chaotic environment. That, that's actually like what they were born to do, right? No, yeah. And I think, 
And then at Kazakh Tech, even if you don't necessarily want to be an entrepreneur, because like, you know, some people don't want that, but it still comes back to like that Elon Musk, I think, as he says it, but like you get paid in proportion to the problems you solve. So right. it's the same way. Like the most successful people aren't the people who go, oh, here's a problem. I'm going to quit. They see, here's a problem. I'm going to look at it 18 different ways till I finally figure out how we break through it, you know? Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, problems aren't worth anything. They're actually a problem. That's why you're trying to get rid of it. Solutions are worth everything. There right? we go. That's, I don't know. That's one of my favorite things about like, I feel like every time you talk to any of the product partners, all three of you have that same thing where like you say, you can say something and you guys take a quote that's like 80% good and you, you guys can stack the like 20% of insight back into it to make it perfect. Because I think that's a much better you know, you get paid for solutions, not problems. And your solutions are worth more if the problems are bigger. So I mean, enough. like, I, I've done a lot of consulting work where companies come in and they show me these reports from the other consultants. And they said, I'll give you an example. We were working with a warehouse team. They said, oh, yeah, our problem is, is we're losing money. And I said, well, yeah, any idiot could have told you you're losing money. Like, you're trying to find out why you're losing money and how not to lose money. And they said, yeah. And I said, so is that what you paid the person to do or to find out that you were losing money? Because we both already knew you were losing money. And so going, giving someone, you know, what's happening, but why, and then how to overcome it. That's where you create value. Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely think that's this, that's like the little bow to tie up that entire concept. Cause that's like the entire concept of, I mean, even business as a whole, you know, is that's, that's the five sentence answer to what is a business. It creates value by solving problems. Like, yeah. And fulfilling a need. Right. So you see that with Patrick, like what's the need? What's the problem? Well, there's a lot of rings on the market. Okay. So he's not, he's not creating a new need because there's our, like I have a need, a ring. It's not a Patrick ring, but I, I have a ring. Right. <laughs> but what he's doing is he's adding flair. He's making rings for men. I think sexy, they're different. They're unique. They're not, you know, traditional and gold. They're a little more pizzazz and, and that's what he's creating. And a lot of customers and you would know this appreciate that. Yeah. And I think that's like, I haven't ran it in a campaign yet, but that's one of the big angles we're trying to take and present at scale is making rings men actually want to wear. Right. Cause I think that's like, that's a good example of it. You don't always need to come up with the most creative. I mean, I would say Patrick's designs are creative, but like super, you don't need to creative. come up with something groundbreaking to disrupt the ind an industry you just have to find a little section of it and say, oh, here's who's not being served well. Right. How do I serve them well? And that's you, where you can get those product ideas. And you know, the, one of the things I tell people is they say, what should I sell? And I say, whatever you can sell. <laughs> like on, on my side, making something's easy. If it can be made, we can make it, right? What's actually valuable is what you can sell. What do customers want to purchase from you? And can you reach the customers to sell it? If you can do that, the product's good. Now, obviously, you know, there's different qualities and grades within the, each product category and some things solve a problem better than others. But when people say, you know, where do I start? What can you sell? If Patrick, straight out of the gate, tried to sell just a standard gold band and he went to, you know, Kay's jewelers. Hey, you guys should carry my, my gold bands. I'm Patrick. I'm a jeweler. And he'd get laughed out the door. You know, they, they wouldn't know who he is. Now his rings are different and eventually they'll want his rings. That, that, that's going to happen, right? They say, yeah. they're going to say, we need a Patrick line and a Dara line. We, we need these rings you're taking too much of our money 
And so I would say, you know, like, like you're saying, Lewis, find a niche, find something that works and blow it up. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think that's perfect. I want to, I want to jump into some more like, these are kind of the questions I had in probably 2016, 2017. And mm-hmm. so I kind of want to get the answers from like the expert that I wish I could have gotten without, you know, four years of trial and error. I think so, my, my glasses off. I kind of want you walk me through what's the process like if say I want to get, I have this idea. I think it's this cool new product. It's perfect yeah, yeah. for my market. What do I need to do to make it easy for someone like you to actually help me get it made, get it brought to market? Well, what's easiest for us is if the engineering, the design, things like that are done. We call it a tech pack. If we have a tech pack with all the specs, details, things like that, we're ready to go, right? Um, But most people that come to us don't know what they don't know. And that's okay, right? We understand that. What we want is for them to have done a lot of the research ahead of time. You know, we're not here to do your research and to figure out A versus B and where it's going to go. We want you to tell us exactly where you want to sell it, how much it's going to cost, things like that, and then let us do our job and go find it and make it in the highest quality possible at the price point you're giving us. That, that's what we want to do focus on procurement. So we essentially, that's a long way of saying, know what you want and understand where your product fits in the market. If you have that, everything else goes very quickly. Yeah. Cause I mean, obviously, I mean, it's obvious to you and it's now obvious to me. I don't know how probably hasn't been obvious to me for very long. I'll be honest, but um, you guys, it's really not your job or anyone who does anything similar to what you do's job to say, you know what, you should change this. A simple example is like from black to blue. You know, you guys don't want to be the, well, should I make my, should I make it out of this metal? Cause it looks like this or this metal. Cause it looks like this. You guys might have insight on something like strength or right, right, right. quality grade, things of that nature, but you don't want to, that's really my job as the entrepreneur or the company or the influencer to come to you and say, this is what I want. Here's, it's exactly, this is what I envision. You guys make this and you guys are going to come back with the things that are more about quality and grade. Like, oh, you shouldn't make that out of leather because it just makes no sense for how it's going to wear with your use case. For example, we, um, we had a customer that was making a plastic injected product and it had multiple pieces and um, each piece was to be a different color on a gradient where they changed gradually throughout each piece, right? And uh, we said, so what are the Pantones? And he said, well, this one is this Pantone and everything else is whatever you want. And I said, no, not whatever I want. You tell me what you want and we'll make it. And they were a little taken back and I said, it's not my responsibility to design your product. It's my responsibility to make sure it's made exactly like your design. Yeah. Right. And I think that's a way to sum it up. And people, it's like you say, like when a lot of people have never thought of that, so they do, they get taken aback. They're like, what? But you don't want to be liable for, you know, he says, make it whatever you want. You choose a color. I assume, is that what a Pantone is? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. It's a color. I was like, I was guessing. It's a color. But, um, yeah. You choose a color and that comes back and he's like, you know what? I really hate that yellow. Like that's an ugly yellow. You guys need to remake a thousand of these. And they're like, well, you told me whatever I want, but it obviously wasn't whatever I want. And now there's all this contention. And so it's like, no, we get the design out. You, you design it. I make it how you design. So when I come out with it and then you say, oh, I really hate this yellow. You say, well, that's the yellow you chose. So if you want to remake them, we can remake them. We got burned a few years ago. And um, I'm not saying physically burned, but <laughs> essentially a customer was trying to lower the cost a little bit. And he said, look, find a way, just make it a little bit cheaper. So we did, we lowered the cost about, you know, 10 or 12% to make it a little bit cheaper. The final product was great, but they got it and they said, no, 
this quality isn't good enough. And he demanded a refund. And he said, well, we made it a little bit cheaper. Well, you made it too cheap. A little bit is so, <laughs> a little bit to you and a little bit to us doesn't mean the same thing, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we just kind of learned we, our role is to execute, but it's their role to drive and lead and control. And, you know, what's nice with SwitchPod is we have a relationship with them now where we can come and we can suggest, we can recommend, we can say, you know, if we were you, we would do this. But they also know that at all times, they have final decision-making ability. They have the ability to say yes and no on everything. So, yeah, for people to come to us with what they want, how they want it, where they want it, when, et cetera, that makes all the difference to us. Yeah, I think, I think that's kind of the perfect, that was the answer I was looking for. Cause I know when I was like first looking for things, like I, you know, I wasn't obviously like when I very first started, like I wasn't even talking to people like you, I'd be like on Alibaba, like, Hey, can you do this? And you just get these responses back and they're like, what? You know, they're like, yeah, exactly. Not, they're like, can you send me a CAD file? And you're like, no, no, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know I needed that. Sorry. Now, I'll say this. We have people that want to pay me, you know, personally, my own, you know, I have a holding company as well, to do consulting to help them get ideas. We have engineers and think tanks that we can put them in to help them come up with ideas. They're not cheap. They're actually very expensive. But um, it's an option. And, and a lot of people do that because they find that they just need that wall to bounce ideas off of. And they also realize um, I had a gentleman call me, he goes, I want to be in this industry. I've done all this stuff before, but, but this industry is unique. Can I talk to you about it? And so we'll coach them on how the products in that industry or that good or service are made, what the features, the materials, and we'll do some of the research and they'll do research and they'll use it as a platform to help them develop the idea better. You know, those are things that, you know, product can do. Um, but if you're saying you want to hire us to make something, you have to know what you want to make. Yeah. I think, I think, and it's that simple. Cause yeah, right. You worked. Um, I guess this is, I just know a lot about switch Cause that was like a very public campaign. You guys yeah, did, you know, you guys so. kind of walked through the whole process and especially where it was going up on Kickstarter, there was a uh -huh. lot of background information, but were you guys the ones who actually engineered that you guys yeah. facilitated the engineering? So that was one where you started. They were more in the idea stage even. Well, it started at a, at a conference called Vid Summit. Mm -hmm. And Pat and Caleb, Caleb is Pat's camera guy and has been for years and his videographer and he's awesome and he's great. And um, they were talking about this problem and they were looking at everyone holding their cameras and Caleb's like, you know, Pat, this is a problem. And Pat's like, I know. And then Richie walked by right then. And... Um, and they started speaking and they said, look, we don't know the solution, but we can clearly tell at a conference all about video that there's a problem. And so they came to us, we set up a call, then we brought in our engineer and uh, you know, we started the journey of creating it. But same thing, they didn't have, they didn't know what they wanted, but they knew what the problem was. And so we created the solution for them. That's an expensive process, by the way. Yeah. No, yeah. I was going to say, I, I don't know if we're, I don't want, we don't have to dive in any numbers, but I was going to say, I've heard in converse, private conversation, you guys reference numbers and stuff. And I know that is not a, that's not what you do when you're just starting out with, you know, $3,000 in your pocket trying to launch your first idea. No, no. That is, yeah. No, or $30,000 for that yeah. matter. So I was going to say, I think. I have a number in my head that I remember the engineering costing and I'm not going to say it cause it's probably wrong, but it was a lot. And it might even be more than that. So yeah, probably. But you know what? But again, if you ask Pat and Kayla, it was worth it. Yeah. And you I, know what I mean? So yeah. And it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, if you have the money, um, I look at it to like bring it to another kind of industry, but like app development, right. I have, I work with a couple YouTubers and a couple large bloggers who like, that's their thing is they come up with an app idea and they want to, you know, make it monetize it and all this stuff. And when people look at it and hear the cost, they're like, you spend $80,000 or whatever for that. But then they're like, 
yeah, but it makes me $500,000 a year for basically marginal upkeep, you know? So they're like, I know, a, I know a young lady who spent uh, about $120,000 developing an app, which is, it has a lot of video content mm -hmm. and structures. So it was a little bit, you know, more premium of an app to develop, but it makes her about 25,000 a month now. Yeah. See. And so it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, sometimes you hear a number and it's really large, but it's because if you want to do things that make $30,000 a month, it's probably not free to break into that market. You know? But you know, if I was getting into the market space right now, I had zero dollars. I'd do exactly what Gary Vaynerchuk says to do to go and get free stuff off KSL or Facebook or Craigslist or wherever the heck you're getting it, the classified ads and try to sell it. And I would try to identify trends and then take that profit and buy things that are moving better. That, that is what I would be doing. And eventually I would be going on something like Taobao, DHgate, AliExpress, you know, Alibaba, I think a lot of people use it for the, I'm going to call it a micropreneur. I don't even know if that's a word, but for the person that's really starting out with limited funds, Alibaba is not the place for you. Alibaba serves a, a really specific niche, which is they want orders at around five to $15,000. Like that's what they actually want. And nothing more or less than that. I, yeah, I was going to say, we spend, I don't think, I think our minimum order we spend at Patrick Air Designs on Alibaba is sometimes it'll be like $3,000, but it's it's about five to $15,000 in order. And that's really okay. like their money yeah. spot. Like that's their sweet spot. Yeah. And because we have that relationship with the vendor, like if we go, hey, we, you know, we need this quantity of this really specific item that's, you know, it's only $3,000. They'll still come through with it, but right. that's what, I mean, the first time I think our first purchase, I think had a minimum of $7,500. Yeah. Once you got it, th but. There's obviously that's not always the case and some things are yeah. different, but if I was a, a starting entrepreneur and I had, I wanted to find a product that sells, I, I wouldn't spend that much. And I would try to identify and try to validate my idea by buying a white label product and seeing what's the demand. Even if I don't sell any, what's the click through? How many people are looking at it? Where did they go to? Which website did they go after they clicked on this? So things like that. Yeah. That's what I try to figure out. Um, because going all in on a product like SwitchPod early, you know, that takes a lot of money. Like yeah. a lot of money. And, and it's a lot of risk, right? As it's well. Risk. And especially like for someone like Pat, he's already started with a leg up. He's got a large audience that he doesn't even have to right. pay for. So like right. he has a pretty good number in his head of like, you know what? I can probably, I have X number of fans that just to be blunt, like even if I put out a bad product would probably buy it just because they like me and they'd want to support me. So I can, I know I'm not going to put out a bad product so I can rely on them making up x percentage of revenue and know that i'm if i start and it costs me you know but you know there's something pat doesn't say about the switch pod we've developed four products for him in the past and he pulled the trigger on the switch pod yeah see so he's he he was trying it he was developing it and i'm sure on the back end or on the front end where or depending on which his perspective he was testing things. He was trying to find out what would stick, what would work. And when they landed on the switch pod, they were like, oh yeah, this is the one. Yeah. This is it. Yeah, exactly. And so like, obviously he's a very smart business person. He's not going to, he's not going to release a bad product. No chance. No. But I just mean, I think that's another thing is like, we're taking an example and some people that are listening, it's not an example that's easy to relate to because you can't fathom, you know, being able to have a hundred and, 50,000 plus people who read your emails so you know that you can spend a good amount of money developing a product and right. as long as you can get it to be a good product you know you're not gonna 
you might not make a lot, but you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to bat a zero on it, you know? Right, right, right. Now with the development costs, I mean, he could have lost quite a bit of money. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that was the risk he was willing to take. And, and I, again, it's all relative, you know, like you could start making cool shirts with your local shirt printer, make 20 at a time and just make the design so unique and outrageous and ridiculous, loud and different that, you know, you start to see what works. And next thing you know, you start to make hats and then you add hoodies and you're like, Hey, you know what? We also need socks or whatever. So I think starting isn't as difficult and as cash intensive as people make it sound. It can be certainly, but just find something that's different. That's true to you. You know, if you want to buy it, the chances are there's another person of these 7.2 billion on earth that also wants to buy it. It's just, how do you reach them? Exactly. I actually want to touch, I'm going to take it back a little about your kind of like your example of what you would do. Um, have you ever heard of the platform free up? It has three E's. Mm-mm. It's a VA platform. No, I'm not familiar Honestly, with it. He didn't, he didn't take it into like retail e-commerce, but their CEO, his name's or former CEO. I think he's sold and is no longer affiliated. Um, he's going to be a guest in the future. I'm interviewing him actually on Monday. Awesome. But he started with that exact same model and he ended up building a service company. So he started doing like textbook flipping just like someone like Gary Vee would recommend, you know, he'd go to his friends, Hey, I need these textbooks. He actually grew just textbook flipping to a pretty big business on Amazon. And what he realized that trend was, is he's like, I hire a lot of VAs, which makes me a lot of money. And so VAs for people who don't know are virtual assistants. Um, he's like, that makes me a lot of money because I'm outsourcing labor for fairly low costs. Why aren't more people doing this? Like there's things like right. Fiverr, but people run into issues of, oh, I didn't like this VA because they don't know how to hire well or interview well. And so he's like, I'm going to start a more inclusive platform where we offer much more of the process. We pre-vet everyone and then right. we match you with who fits your use case. And so then he grew that company and then sold that. And now he's on to his next project. But that's a very similar, it's exactly what you said, right? You don't have to start, you know, he grew a essentially a service slash tech company because it was all hosted online matching companies to virtual assistants things like that nature so there is a service aspect as well as a technological aspect all starting with zero dollars from just selling free goods just like you recommended and it really does teach you about the market how to sell how to identify trends and so i just want to say that's like the perfect I think for anyone looking to start anything, that's kind of the perfect way to go. Yeah. Yeah. It it doesn't have to be expensive to be successful. Yeah. And I think, I mean, Patrick's another good example. He started kind of the same way instead of his example, it's back to what you said, right? Like let's find a cool material, make a ring. He would sell a ring for like $40 just through his personal network. Like he'd post on Instagram and on Facebook and be like, Hey, I just bought a piece of Malachite for $10 off eBay. I want to make a ring out of it. Send me a bid. And he'd run it like an auction. If you want to, you know, pitch in and I'll make you something. We'll design it to your specs and we'll try to make you something really cool just for you. And I think I remember at first he would make like, cause we were in college. He would make like $30, 30 to $60 and spend like 12 to 14 hours, you know, making it. Cause he just, he was going to make it anyway. He enjoyed the process. So I was like, might as well make 30 bucks while I do it, you know? Yeah. But then that turned into his big business idea. He never once was like, oh, I'm going to throw down, you know, 20 grand to start this. It was, I'm going to throw down. He had a Dremel from Walmart. So I think that's what $20. And then he bought a sheet of carbon fiber for his first ever. And then a, one hole saw. He didn't even have a set of hole saws. He bought one. So I think he was in at like $60 to start Patrick Adair Designs. And now we do, you know, $2 million plus dollars of revenue every year. So it's it doesn't have to be expensive just because some of these examples are expensive. It's just that some of the cool stories happen to have some expense in them. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Okay. So I wanted to touch, I guess kind of back to those questions I was thinking about. Um, This is something I actually learned from you and I probably 
didn't tell you at the time that I didn't know it. I probably even played it off like I knew it. But quality versus grade, I think that's something most people have no idea about. Mm. And I, I remember hearing you talk about it one time and I was like, oh, now it makes sense. Those are two different things. So can you kind of explain what that is, what the difference between quality and grade is? Yeah, quality is literally how well it is made according to the spec. So um, if you're making a thousand Ford cars, the quality would be how well are they each made compared to the model car we made that they're all supposed to be made out of. Grade would be on a scale from highest grade to lowest grade, you know, in Italy, you'd have Ferrari and Maserati next to each other. Then you'd have Alfa Romeo and then you'd have Fiat below that. Quality has nothing to do with those, but grade has everything. Quality is how well it's made according to the spec. And so people need to ask themselves, what grade product do I want to sell? What's my price point? Where do I want to be? Quality is just making it correctly. Yeah. And I think, I think that's one that a lot of people don't understand inherently. No. Cause like as an average consumer, you just think only about quality. You think quality suffices all those terms, you know? And so, or all those characteristics, I guess you should say. Um, so you're like, okay, I want, I want to sell a high quality product but I want it to be, you know, $4. And so then someone says like low grade and you're like, no, no, no. I want it to be high quality. And you're like, no, we can make something $4 out of plastic and still have it be really high quality. It's just a lower grade. Whereas if we were making, say it's a decoration, that same thing out of, you know, some kind of metal and then a luxury metal like gold or silver that pushes it up that grade scale. Right. And That's so exactly just, right. So like we were talking for the switch pod when we were starting out, what do we want to make it out of? We can make it out of ABS plastic, which would be the cheapest of the cheapest, lowest grade, but you can highly control the quality. Do you want to make it out of glass film nylon? Do you want aluminum, stainless steel, zinc? Um, we looked at another material. I can't even remember what it was, but you know, the question came back, what do you want to sell it for? And then what, what do you think is a fair margin? And then once they've did their numbers, they said, look, we want to sell it. We think it's a 99, 99 product because it is, it's, it's, and it's worth it. You have one, you know, and then they said, we have to pay, you know, this much or less, including everything. And so we said, what's the highest grade product that we can deliver in high quality at these price points. And that's what we did. And so yeah. we ended up with aluminum and it's kind of cool. I don't know. This is the part of me that like loves operations that's thinking about this. So a lot of people might not think this is cool, That it almost makes it, if you can put it in those terms, it's just at that point, it's just a math problem, right? You know, I, I know people are willing to pay a hundred dollars. I know we want to bring in $25 from each sale back into our own pocket. It's going to cost this much to advertise. So we need this cost of goods sold. And then we go, Hey T how, what can you make it out of at this price? Yeah. And it makes it really simple. And you're just going to come back and say, well, this is what we can do. Whereas I think that's kind of a hiccup that I've seen before in product sourcing, especially on our end, when we were a little more naive, where we'd come and say, well, we have all these points. And then they come back and they say, well, we, okay. So then it has to be like this. And we go, Oh yeah, but we don't want it like that. And they're like, okay, well then something somewhere else has to move because something has to change. Cost. Like, right. We right. can't change anything. We're dealing with, you know, set costs. This factory produces this price per unit at this quantity and this quality and you want these things. So are you going to put less money in your pocket right. and make it a little nicer? Are you going to try to charge more? Are you going to try to whatever? But so I don't know. I just think it's a, it's a cool little framework to think about for me that always gets me excited when we're working that said people. most manufacturers they're just like what, what quality do you want in china <laughs> like they don't understand it but i think when on your end when you're developing and you're you're positioning yourself on the market 
quality has nothing to do with it unless it was poorly made and you're like, oh, this wasn't yeah. made well, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think, I don't know, that's kind of my, what I really learned from you when you taught me that was that I'm almost never, I almost never care about the quality because I always just want good quality, you know? There's, there's no leeway on the quality. It's exactly. all about quality. I always want it to be good quality. And like, we've had that before where, where we, obviously we do most of our manufacturing in-house in America. Right. In Salt Lake. But you um, buy subcomponents. Yes, buy subcomponents. So we do a lot of sourcing, just not um, a finished like goods. the final, the final steps are all happening in Salt Lake. Right. And we've had whole products before where the grade I mean, I, I don't want to say products by name because I don't want to mm -hmm. highlight things. the grade, you know, it was a thousand, multiple thousand dollar product. The grade was there, but the quality wasn't. Mm. And we'd find that out and we'd have to scrap a whole product line and it might involve, you know, carrots of diamonds or exceptional amounts of gold, but we had one thing in our process where we couldn't get the quality. And so it's like, we're never sacrificing on quality. Right. Whereas we might, you know, have three versions of a product, one with actual diamonds, one with cubic zirconium. That's sacrificing the grade. We'll do that. We won't ever move the quality slider though, because you just can't afford to, because that affects customer satisfaction. That's right. And then, so then in some circumstances you have where the grade of the good is the same but one is just made better, mm -hmm. you know? And so the quality is increased. And you see that less today because vehicle man manufacturers are very good, but it used to be that there were really, really bad vehicle manufacturers and people would know, you know, this car, it's, it's not well made. You're like, what do you mean? It's the same price. Well, they're using the same quality materials, same grade materials, but their assembly plant just isn't good, right? And so what, what we think it needs, uh, some people talk about quality as durability. So you'll see this in parts of things you buy where you're like, why does this thing always, uh, windshield wipers is a good one. Why does it always break after nine months or whatever it is? Well, the answer is because they want you to buy new windshield wipers every nine months. <laughs> like they've worked really, really hard to make sure that the quality of it lasts for that specific period of time and then they make you buy another one yeah i think and that's interesting right that's you see that a lot in like tech with mm -hmm. you know like apple with their batteries they had those issues with where they or got samsung over. slowing down your phones with updates yeah purposely. yeah because they're like we want you to move along to the next product because that's where we make like we make money when you purchase. So if you're purchasing for 10 years, that's a lot lower lifetime value than if you're purchasing every two years, you know? Exactly. Um, oh, sweet. This has been, this has been awesome. Where, where can people go find you and product? Uh, Product.com is a good one. And then LinkedIn is the biggest one for me and TikTok. I'm on TikTok now. I love TikTok. At the product guy. At product guy on TikTok. Product guy. And then uh, my name on LinkedIn. Those are the big two. Okay. You should probably spell your name for people. I will also, it'll be spelt places, but. Yeah. I, um, if you go uh, on LinkedIn, it's a tough one. I got a tough name, guys. I'm so sorry. It's a T H I E F A I N E. Last name Magre, M A G R E. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, I literally 90% of the time just do the letters T, F, N. I and do I'll, too. Hit, I'll hit search and I'll be like, where is he? And then I'm like, oh yeah, that's not actually how you spell his name. I'm like, But you know, I think I'm getting there. I think getting, eventually you'll Google search T, F, N and I'll be the one. I'm look, really looking forward to that. Oh, there you go. You got to do it. All right. Sweet. Thanks, man. It was awesome. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this episode. I thought that was an awesome interview with TFN from Product. They're one of the industry leaders in helping entrepreneurs and especially influencers manufacture cool and interesting products. Um, I just wanted to remind you to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it so you can see next time or follow on whatever podcast platform you're currently using. And also remember that 
these interviews are sponsored by my personal consulting company. So if you want to get updates on the projects we're working on, you can check out our newsletter at faucetdigital.com forward slash newsletter. There will be a link in the description. Thanks. Have a nice week. See you next Friday.